Hello and welcome to Hot Pursuit, part of Ahwal podcast series and video series. Uh, today, we gathered here again to talk about the events circulating around Turkey, uh, which are real uh, stories in depth that should be approached in depth. Uh, I have two guests with me from Washington, D.C. Uh, Merve Tahirolu is the Turkey coordinator with Project on Middle East and Democracy. Welcome, Merve. Thank you. And Associate Professor uh, Sinan Jitti is uh, with the Marine Corps University in Virginia, Washington, D.C. Hello, Sinan. Hello there. Well, uh, let's begin uh, with the uh, most spectacular event that uh, was introduced to, to the world uh, in 24th of July, uh, opening, reopening of Hagia Sophia as a mosque, reconversion of the, of the monumental building, which is part of the global cultural heritage, one of the most magnificent uh, constructions uh, that uh, have been visited by millions and millions over, over the decades and centuries. And uh, the reconversion of Hagia Sophia as a mosque uh, was, of course, uh, meant to be a big ceremony, big event, uh, in order to uh, reassert uh, the image of uh, President Erdogan and his cadres of the AKP. And uh, crowds have gathered outside the monument on Thursday, 24th of July. And inside the ceremony, of course, included, contained all the power figures. Uh, of, of today's Turkey, uh, Bahçeli, and many other people. And um, 24th of July is a significant date as well. It will not have marked the reopening of Hagia Sophia as a mosque, but it is also significant in terms of uh, being, an anniversary, being the anniversary of the uh, Lausanne Treaty, which is one of the uh, main pillars of the uh, or foundation of the uh, modern Turkish Republic. Uh, it was not uh, chosen uh, randomly, this date. Uh, it was also apparently meant to send signals to the world. We, let's start with Hagia Sophia. Let's start with Merve. Uh, what are your thoughts and comments about uh, this, this big event, this groundbreaking, perhaps a game-changing event? It was indeed groundbreaking, and I think completely justifying the, the level of international attention it got. I mean, not only was it a grand ceremony itself on Friday, Erdogan himself led prayers, hundreds of thousands of people actually joined it, and it was highly televised. Uh, it almost tried to uh, communicate to the, to the uh, both to Turkey's Erdogan's domestic audience in Turkey, but also to an international crowd that Erdogan is now positioning himself as sort of a caliph, self-declared caliph, the leader of the Muslim world. And this is something that he's been wanting to do for a long time, but, but using a Sophia, something, a, a monument that is uh, so symbolic with, with so much historical uh, significance to so many cultures was, was highly, not only highly symbolic, but I think is telling of how Erdogan sees himself and also how he sees Turkey. Uh, you mentioned that this, this coincided with the day of the, the Lausanne Treaty being signed, which was, of course, one of the founding uh, documents of the Turkish Republic. Uh, this, is, this is something, uh, and a, a, a piece of document, actually, that, that Turkey's Islamists have always criticized Turkey's founding fathers um, uh, with, with, with not getting more, uh, more out of the deal with the Western powers when, when Turkey's founding fathers were negotiating the terms of the republic that they were creating. And this was right after a, 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 a main Turkey was coming out of, and um, it, it, it basically set the terms of what the Turkish Republic would look like for the next hundred years. And Islamists have always leveled uh, uh, several several criticisms uh, of the of this deal um, throughout the last uh, hundred years, and, and and most of the times it's even based on conspiratorial thinking and not even actual facts governing this document. So Erdogan, by by coinciding this conversion of this very important building for so many cultures that have come through. Uh, Turkish territory and, and, and the multiple empires, the two grand empires that Istanbul has cut as uh, over his history um, has played uh, the, the, the capital of. He is not only turning a page behind this important history that, that Istanbul and Turkey represent. 
the sense of multiculturalism and everything about that, but also to the beginning of the Turkish Republic, what we might potentially call the, the first Turkish Republic. And this is almost as if the inauguration of the second Republic that is going to be Erdogan's. Mm -hmm. Sinan? Yeah, I mean, just looking at the visuals coming out of uh, July 24, we can say several things. Um, based on both of what you said, first of all, Erdogan knew precisely that it would uh, garner a strong international response, mainly negative, and this is what he was aiming for, precisely because it essentially uh, galvanizes public opinion towards positivity towards him in the short term, and that's precisely why he did this. Um, Reflecting on the crowds. Is it all about domestic politics? Of course, yeah. I mean, at this point, um, you know, if you look at the sort of crowds that were like celebrating and running down, chanting Islamic uh, sort of um, uh, cheers across the street, it was a crowd that was sort of drunken with ignorance, um, as best as I can put it. And I don't mean that in a, in a, in a demeaning sense, although it is uh, somewhat demeaning. I, I, I understand that. But you know, why, what, what, what is the basis of celebrating this? Okay, let's, let's just, check the, you, know, uh, you know, based on what Mara said. Um, the Lausanne Treaty, there is so much ignorance around this. Uh, this is basically possibly a failing of our, of Turkey's education system to sort of hammer out and basically make people remember what this is all about, what it stands for. If you ask the average person in the United States, what does 1776 mean to you? What does July 4th mean to you, right? Uh, the Declaration of Independence. Um, you know, you're going to have a, very, a variety of opinion, but there is going to be a consensus that this was a net positive, a gain for the United States, that it declared itself an independent uh, and, and sovereign nation that was free from tyranny, right? Um, forget the folklore. You know, we in Turkey still don't understand or have a basic consensus as to what Lausanne helped achieve. We have all these sort of conspiracy theories that there are sort of secret sort of components to it that, you know, that basically tore away from the independence and this wasn't as big a celebration as it, as it should be sort of remembered for. It is a grand compromise which put Turkey on the map of the world as a state, a, mm -hmm. you know, a nascent state that gained its economic, political uh, sovereignty uh, and, and, and basically, uh, if for no, no other reason, the ability of Erdogan to sit in, that, in Hagia Sophia for people to chant in the streets uh, and, and celebrate, you know, uh, the conversion into a mosque. None of this would be happening. None of this had Lausanne not been signed. Lausanne is the title, the deed of the country. It, it, people forget that the last sultan of the empire signed away the keys to not only Istanbul, but for the entire Ottoman Empire to the British Empire and said, here you go. This is yours. I surrender. You know, we've, the, the, the Erdogan government calls, uh, you know, the Inonu governments, the Ataturk governments, you know, uh, tutelary or Vesayetchi in Turkey, right? Mm -hmm. These two individuals resulted in Turkey gaining its sovereign independence as an equal state in the world, without which Turkey today would not exist and would be a, a, a series of divided satellite states that would have been carved up by the empires, right? Yeah. And this is conveniently forgotten, and it is not taught, and it befuddles me that we still don't have a basic understanding in, in Turkey what Lausanne stands for, and instead you have a limited number of crowds in the hundreds of thousands, whatever, however sort of big they want to portray it, drunken with celebration over the conversion of a mosque sorry, a museum, into a mosque. Mm -hmm. And my colleague, this is not my idea, but my colleague said, you know, Alan Mikowski, he essentially iterated the other day saying, this is not necessarily the loss of or transition from secularism in Turkey into a sort of more Islamic sort of uh, mm -hmm. country. And there is a component of that, I believe. But Ataturk did this in 19, you know, he converted Hagia Sophia into a museum mm -hmm. as a peace offering to Turkey, the Ottoman Empire's former foe, the Greeks because he essentially looked at this and thought, we need to have peaceful relations, right? With all of our neighbors, all of our former adversaries, so we can exist as an independent sovereign state in a club of states. Mm -hmm. That is what has been provided. 
Well, uh, yet um, uh, the immediately in the aftermath of the opening, um, we started seeing and hearing some social media viral tweets and some um, cautious, discreet uh, assertions questioning Lausanne Treaty, which, of course, uh, one would believe, one would be inclined to, to assess, will, will, will gain power. Uh, Lausanne Treaty, I think, is open for debate uh, uh, in the coming months and years until 2023. Uh, some uh, would argue that uh, the German resentment to, to Versailles Treaty in 1919 led to the rise of uh, Nazis and Hitler and uh, led to Second World War. And uh, I was perhaps not surprised to, to see these immediate uh, questioning of Lausanne Treaty as some sort of straitjacket for Turkey. And you, you can see that also in the expansionist uh, tendencies or signs of through Blue Homeland, Eastern Mediterranean, etc that uh, that uh, Lausanne Treaty is is being now more and more uh, increasingly seen as a as a as a straitjacket uh, and um, I think if you look at this from this perspective perhaps I don't know if you agree with me or not uh, Merve and Sinan but I think what what puzzles or baffles uh, us is that um, uh, the um, uh, the changes that, play, that take place in Turkey makes Hagia Sophia opening uh, only a component, as you say, of, of, the, of the big picture, but an important step, important threshold. But I think the continuity is there uh, of questioning each and every part of, of uh, what Lausanne Treaty means, what the foundation of the Turkish Republic means, uh, because if you remember well, uh, Erdogan and his cadres are talking, have been talking for a long time about the parenthesis, historic parenthesis that should be closed at some time. How do we see when we see that, when we, when we place Hagia Sophia in uh, the conversion into, into this big, big, big picture? I think it's important for, for the international audience to also to understand because as, 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 as little as there's knowledge in, in Turkey about Lausanne Treaty, as you mentioned, there is also, I think, quite a big indifference or, or ignorance about what Lausanne Treaty means or the stability of the southeastern flank of, of, of Europe. And also, on, in, in general, the, you know, the, the system, the Western system. Mary? Absolutely. I mean, questioning the Lausanne Treaty is like, a, a, and similarly, the conversion of Hagia Sophia, questioning the status of Hagia Sophia as a museum set forth by the founding fathers of Turkey. All of this is questioning essentially uh, all of tur what Turkey represented previously as a nation state, as, as a republic, as I mentioned. Uh, so there is so much disinformation around this treaty. Most uh, I, I have spoken to multiple people, for example, in the last month alone, who uh, have who believe things like the, the the treaty has precluded Turkey from ever exploiting any natural gas reserves or oil or any natural resources. It it precludes Turkey from conducting certain le levels of trade uh, with certain countries. All of these things that the treaty does not do is being attributed to it by uh, um, really the, the, it's always been done by the Islam. Now we're talking about the actual leaders of the country. Uh, they're propagating uh, these, these notions that basically this treaty, far from setting the trajectory of the Turkish Republic, constrained uh, Turkey, constrained its growth, uh, as you mentioned, forced Turkey into this box from which it cannot emerge. And Erdogan has been over and again uh, is reiterating this date, 2023, when this is supposed to expire. The idea is that after that point, he can uh, he can set his own trajectory for Turkey, which is going to be, as you said, perhaps a bit more. I mean, looks like it's going to be more irredentist. It looks like it's going to be much less secular and much less interested, as Tina mentioned, in maintaining peaceful uh, uh, relations with 
Turkey's neighbors and, and particularly adversaries of the former Ottoman Empire. So I think it, it, it speaks a lot, uh, this conversion and the dates and, and this questioning of the, the founding principle or the founding um, uh, uh, pillars of Turkey. Uh, a bit of a revolutionary uh, a leader in that he wants to turn Turkey into something completely new. He's already done this with his presidential system. He's already done this through various cultural policies uh, and economic policies that he has set over the last uh, almost 20 years. And he has his eyes set on post-2023. We will not be talking about Turkey the way we have before and after 2023 and this is one of the major inaugural steps of that of that new republic Merve, the reconversion of Hagia Sophia as a mosque also seems to 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 um, uh, have broken a, a, a wall people now are expressing fear more more openly uh, after this uh, seculars uh, intellectuals etc i keep hearing and um, i'm sure you do as well that now that uh, this happened, uh, maybe uh, soon we will see an Islamic calendar. Uh, maybe we will see, uh, you know, men being a, being able to de jure, you know, uh, being able to marry four women, uh, and uh, all of the Istanbul again becoming a capital uh, soon before 2023, or, or as approaching uh, to to that date. All of these um, agenda issues uh, that people attribute to Erdogan and his cadres, are now being expressed uh, more and more in 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 uh, in great deal of intimidation, sense of intimidation. Do you agree with those those concerns and fears? And also, also the Istanbul uh, Agreement, the so-called Istanbul Agreement. I, I do, but I also think that they are a bit of a distraction, uh, to mm -hmm. be honest, uh, because what we what we have been experiencing in, in Turkey is already there are these important fears, of course, coming the, from the secular. I think we are losing Merve, but uh, let, let her come back. Sinan, um, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we're hearing is it's almost the second anniversary of the transition into the presidential system, right? And what is happening is it is clear <laughs> that this new system of government is not working, that governability is now an issue which is unresolvable because policy is not being effective, it is not strengthening the economy, it is not essentially shoring up the political cohesiveness of the country, and Erdogan in the face of the pandemic, as well as the economic weakness of the country, is losing uh, voter support en masse. And as a result of that, um, in order to sort of shore up his political support base, he is turning to, uh, to more radical extremes. Hagia Sophia is just one of these examples. Okay. Is he losing control uh, or is he gaining control? That I cannot answer at this moment. It seems like he is, seems to be in control as in still on top of the edifice of the state, but his political agenda is increasingly being held ransom by more fringe political and support bases, one of which, are, which are the, uh, here are the tariqats in order to essentially mobilize their voter base and support for the government of Erdogan and his ally, uh, the MHP, they are making more and more extreme requests of Erdogan. You know, the Hagia Sophia is just one thing. The, the, the cancellation of the Istanbul Agreement is likely another. The end of the equality between men and women is likely to be another. You know, there are some analysts that watch Turkey suggesting that with Hagia Sophia, Erdogan has essentially spent his last round of, of essentially, you know, trying to sort of shore up his political base. I vehemently disagree with that. You mm. know, they call us the pessimists, but so you're alluding to some of them. Um, with the end of institutional secularism, there is nothing to suggest that Turkey's Alevi minority will not be systematically targeted in terms of actual uh, 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 hate speech and actual uh, vigilante uh, attacks let alone other religious and ethnic minorities, which, which have already struggled with this sort of entity. So um, I think this is the beginning, because uh, up until 2023, there are many more symbolic actions that the government can now take, right? Uh, such as, like you suggested, uh, making Islam the capital again, uh, uh, and, you know, ending the secular order. Changing uh, the alphabet. Uh, right, uh, I mean, that, that would be extreme. Um, you know, Erdogan's no fool. 
to be extent, you know, with, with the Hagia Sophia comment he said last year saying, you know, you fill up uh, the blue mosque first and then we can talk to see if we need to convert Hagia Sophia into a mosque again. He, he doesn't believe this. He knows that it's not necessarily fruitful, but he's up against the wall electorally and politically. He needs to come up with essentially uh, ways to essentially galvanize and mobilize public sentiment towards him. He does not have the economic means to do that, but adversarial, divisive, polarization politics seem to have worked for him this far. And I think there's nothing to suggest that they won't continue working for him in, in the near future. Um, authoritarian states do survive, and we have many examples, right, that have outlasted and defied reason and logic. Mm -hmm. I've always said this, but one critical example that outlasted numerous economic uh, malaise and collapses is the example of Zimbabwe. Uh, you know, under Robert Mugabe, this country has experienced hyperinflation that Turkey has never experienced, mm -hmm. economic collapse that Turkey has not seen, yet the government stayed in power. Uh, there are other Central Asian republics, which probably Turkey is closer to and resembles more politically and culturally, uh, that Turkey could go down. So uh, I think it would be a mistake to suggest that Erdogan has spent his last round with Hagia Sophia, that because of the economic malaise that he can no longer sustain power. Mm -hmm. I would just say watch this space. Mm -hmm. And Merve, welcome back again. We, <laughs> Thank we just, you. Uh, you got interrupted, but uh, uh, are you sharing those, those uh, thoughts of pessimism? Uh, that, that was my question. I do, but actually, I, I think maybe what I'm going to say might be a bit more pessim sound, sound a bit more pessimistic. But uh, it's it's been very clear to me that when we talk about this Islamization and you know uh, these these fears that the, the secular factions in Turkey have the uh, the, the almost paranoia that uh, Erdogan might change the the dates, the time dates, the calendar, the um, uh, the alphabet, all of these things. He doesn't need to do these things. I mean, Turkey under Erdogan has stopped functioning really like a secular country anyway. Uh, we have seen the kinds of uh, uh, Islamist groups chanting down the streets, sort of taking over the streets and, and, and dominating the streets. This has been a phenomenon really since 2016, uh, at least in Turkey. Secular people, particularly minorities um, or, or vulnerable communities like women, LGBT, um, uh, non-Sunni Muslims in, in Turkey have all felt incredibly intimidated um, by the the empowered uh, factions that are that are uh, that that believe that they are the true owners of Turkey already for so many years and this is and they uh, go around with complete impunity this is because Turkey has no rule of law it has no intention of enforcing uh, any kind of uh, uh, secular democratic uh, 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 system in which everybody can feel like a first-class citizen or women, for example, can feel that the state will protect them uh, from, uh, from violent attackers, which it doesn't. And mm -hmm. so already Turkey, in, in, in my opinion, in the most significant ways that a country can, can stop functioning mm -hmm. as a secular one, Turkey has already passed that point. So I think while this was incredibly sim symbolic and significant, the conversion of Hagia Sophia, because Hagia Sophia symbolized, I think, not a Turkey that existed, uh, but a multicultural Turkey that, that the founding fathers aspired for Turkey. It, it was never really uh, functioning as that kind of a multicultural, diverse, pluralist state, but they envisioned that. So this is a turning a, a page uh, on that entire endeavor. But in terms of the Islamization of society and state, I think we're, we're unfortunately already there and that has to do with the lack of rule of law. Mm -hmm. um, let's complicate the picture a little bit, little further to, to, to create confusion amongst our viewers and listeners. Um, part of the reactions and pessimism that we are discussing is there uh, and all these um, fears of, of the uh, secular Western oriented uh, members of the society, yet, um, in what Veni sees as a baffling or puzzling uh, um, step, uh, Hagia Sophia reconversion uh, united the opposition with the, with the uh, AKP and MHP in, in, in many ways. Uh, uh, there was no clear uh, positioning by 
the CHP, main opposition, a party founded by the founder of the Turkish Republic, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, and also the ex-officers, some of whom spent time in prison, in Silivri, uh, Ergenekon and, and Barrios, Sledgehammer, etc., etc., and those who um, claimed to be the guardians of the, the secularism uh, in Turkey uh, have remained remarkably silent and even active in, in taking part in prayers in, that, in the monument, uh, 24th of July. And uh, this unification around Ayasofya, the first one was the coup d'etat attempt in 2016, again, a reunification moment, has come back. And that has, to a great deal, puzzled the West, Turkey's allies, Turkey's friends abroad. Um, I want to hear what you think about this. Uh, this. This is, of course, a cultural phenomenon as much as political phenomenon. But uh, uh, I think it's worth revisiting and, and analyzing. Yes, Mary. Jan, I think you look like you have a, a thought on this. I, I have to say, I don't quite understand the question. Um, the, qu the question is, uh, how, do you, how do we explain uh, the opposition, uh, main opposition, CHP and the E party, uh, uh, not really taking a distancing themselves from this step, because especially CHP and also E party, uh, in their identity, there is the, the uh, defense of secularism in their program, in their, in their image. Well, I'm, I'm maybe I might be a little too critical here, but I, I, I don't think so because the main opposition has been the main opposition uh, since 2003, and, and nothing has changed in the country. So I think it's uh, it's safe to, to criticize the main opposition. Secularism, uh, philosophically and theoretically speaking, is about democracy. It's about creating a level. Uh, playing field for all factions in society. It's not really, I don't think we should, um, <clears throat> a particularly laicite, that which mm. Turkey has adopted, that strand of secularism is beyond uh, religious device. It should be, uh, it's a type of principle that sh that is about um, enforcing equality among among a diverse group of citizens. Unfortunately, I don't believe that the CHP, Turkey's main opposition party, has ever really um, embodied this principle and uh, really adopted this principle. And this is why, like their reaction to Hagia Sophia, their inability to say that this is <laughs> it, it, not only against the, our own party's um, <laughs> agenda and principles and, and, and ag historical um, uh, actions, but they're unable to say that this is uh, basically showing the dominance of one culture over another in Turkey with this conversion, rather than uh, looking at it, looking at all the cultures as equally important and valuable. They were, in, they were unable to to do this and they're unable to do this when it comes to many many other uh, policies that Erdogan and the AKP and, and also the MHP the, the nationalists and Islamists have put forth in front of them so this is not the first time they're they're reacting this way this is a bigger problem I think it also is is, is it affects Turkey's foreign policy making because we see this in uh, a lot of foreign policy decisions whether it's the war in Libya or or um, uh, military interventions in places like Idlib, for example, um, not just uh, those places in Syria where there is a, a Kurdish insurgency um, a presence. With all of these things, with I the Eastern Mediterranean, with the anti-Americanism, uh, we see the main opposition, the opposition parties, um, allowing the, the reproduction um, of the arguments uh, set forth and the paradigm set forth by the ruling party and by the ruling bloc and unable to create a second alternative narrative. Mm -hmm. This, I think, is the problem with the, the, the understanding of democracy um, by the, the, the failure of the, of the main opposition party okay. to truly understand, I think, both what secularism means and what democracy means. And Sinan, uh, what, is your, um, what is your take on this? Uh, opposition uniting around Hagia Sophia move. Yeah, I mean, what the, the, the thing that came to my mind was, 
you know, this is a hard one for them. Um, if, you know, just to put this into context, you know, since, at least since the 1950s, Turkey's right-wing movement, beginning with the Democrat Party, um, but also prior to that, um, Turkey's religious sort of political activists, to the extent that they existed, have always branded the CHP uh, as enemies of Islam, right? If we remember with Menderes essentially, you know, converting the, the, the call to prayer back from uh, Turkish into Arabic, um, all the way throughout the 60s and 70s, there has been a pronounced effort uh, and, and quite an effective sort of branding of the CHP by Turkey's right-wing parties, both from the Islamist right to the nationalist right to the center right, as, actually, as, actually, as essentially enemies of, of Islam. Mm. So it is hard for the opposition to actually make a, step, make a stand against the Hagia Soviet conversion, saying, you know, this is contrary to secularism, it hurts Turkey's relations abroad. All those are given, and I agree with those, but it's extremely hard issue for these guys to, 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 to sort of coalesce around. And I think Erdogan knows this, right? It, it's mm. extremely difficult. Um, that's the first point I would make. The second point is that it's something we've said before on this program. I mean, we all understand that it's extremely difficult to be a political opposition in Turkey because like, like we just said, it's, you know, opposition has been like a pastime almost since 2003 with very little sort of possibility to effectively take over the reins of government. You know, the transition of power from one party to another doesn't exist in Turkey anymore. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, um, at this point, you know, I do not understand what the political opposition in Turkey has to lose, other than essentially taking a stand against the AKP and Erdogan. If you don't have a prudent and, you know, you know, a, coale a coalescing platform that you can put the voters as to what you stand for, rather than worry about what Erdogan's going to do to you, how Erdogan's going to brand you, as in, you know, you're, 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 you are an Americanist, you are, a, you know, you are anti-Islam, Rather than worrying about that reaction or, you know, being cast as like a PKK lover, quote unquote, right? Uh, you know, if you, if you want to sort of come have a dialogue with, with the HDP, you know, instead of worrying and fearing what's going to happen to you as a political entity, why don't you take a stand and say, this is what we stand for. We are not going to let the principles of secularism fall by. Yes, we have an issue of race relations in Turkey, ethnicity and democratic governance, but... If we don't have a, if you don't have that platform, what, what is the point of you existing mm. as an opposition party, right? If Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu does not sort of, you know, have a dialogue with other parties or actually have a definitive platform as to what they stand for, I do not understand at this point in time why they continue to exist as, as an entity because there, there seems to be very little to, to lose. So it, this constant reacting to what Erdogan is going to do to them um, and hence shying away from the bigger, larger debate is hurting them with, in the eyes of uh, sort of people who are looking for an alternative. I see. Uh, we have a very little time. Uh, Can I just add one, 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 one Very briefly, because we are running out. Yeah, sorry. I mean, this is, it's not like the, the, the opposition is completely unable to do this. I last think Demirtas, the core chair of the HDP, did this really well, set the narrative himself, rather than reacting to our narrative. Uh, Imamoğlu, uh, the mayor of Istanbul, did this during the campaign just last year in, when, in the re-election. Every time Erdogan tried to portray him as a Greek lover, etc., he hugged Greek people and said, yes, I do like uh, Greek people. You know, reacted in a way where he accepted it. So I think the opposition can do it. Every time it has done it, it has reaped the benefits of it. It needs to re-adopt this as, a, as its full-time agenda. Um, we promised our viewers and listeners that we would speak more uh, on other issues other than uh, Sofia, but we are running out of time. And uh, I think there's a lot to digest uh, about what we, what you said and what we heard about uh, Sofia, what it signifies, etc. But in some, if I have to summarize what you're saying, I think it is fair to say that Turkey is deep, a political crisis, a cultural crisis, social crisis, is, is an economic crisis, is, is deepening. And uh, we are now in the, I think, in, in the depths of that crisis. Uh, there is not uh, any sort of flicker of hope uh, for the opposition or for any challenges to the current uh, power structure. I think we should leave it there uh, because there is a lot more to say about it. Uh, we, we will, I'm sure, talk about foreign policy issues in our next conversation. But let's leave it there and uh, 
thank you, Merve uh, from POMED, and thank you, Sinan Jitli from uh, uh, Marine Corps University in Virginia, Washington, D.C. Uh, talk to you again.